Well, good to be here with you again this evening. I think I forgot to bring greetings from the Heath Church this morning, but I, I do bring them warmly from the, uh, the members at the Heath. We're in the same battle together. Uh, we're still uh, pilgrims and uh, witnessing for the Lord here this side of, of glory. There's a greater congregation above. Uh, they're enjoying their rest, but we're still here to be part of the, the battle and to take the gospel. So may God continue to bless you uh, here as we work together in the same cause. Well, we began this morning to look at this miracle that happened in Capernaum. Jesus went down to Capernaum and it really was going down. Nazareth, 1,400 feet above sea level. Capernaum, 700 feet uh, below sea level. One of the many, many fishing communities around the Sea of Galilee. He's beginning his ministry. He carries out his ministry voluntarily in the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he could have worked in his own innate power. He doesn't do that. He's found in fashion as a man and he conducts his ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he, the Lord Jesus, received the Spirit without measure. We receive the same Holy Spirit with a degree of measure. And uh, we know the ebbing and the flowing and the urgent need of the day is that we should know that power of the Holy Spirit as individual believers and uh, particularly when it comes to the preaching of the gospel. The people who listened to Jesus Christ on this uh, Sabbath day in Capernaum, it would have been a Saturday, and uh, there he is teaching on the Sabbath day. And we looked at simply this this morning. The people were astonished at his teaching for his word possessed authority. And uh, Mark's gospel, the parallel passage says, the people were astonished because he spoke as one who had authority and not as the scribes and the Pharisees. I don't know what the scribes and the Pharisees were like at the time, in Capernaum, I don't know if people had their fav favourite preachers, or it's uh, Pharisee such and such today, who's on the rotus, scribe Sydney, whatever it might have been, this preacher from Gat Nazareth is quite different to anyone they'd ever heard before. He preached and spoke and taught with authority. There was a power in what he was saying. There were no sleepers that morning in Capernaum, in the congregation. They were all giving their rapt attention to what Jesus was saying. Um, maybe there's a, a rule at school and uh, you're not allowed to walk on the grass in the quadrangle at the center of the school. <clears throat> and there's a path going around. As you go from lesson to lesson, you do not walk on the grass you go around the path. But you're late for your lesson, so you're making your way across the grass. You've got a quick look around. There's nobody uh, there. And suddenly you hear a voice. You there, boy! And it sounds exactly like the headmaster, but you turn around and it's Jones in 4C who does a very good impression of the headmaster. So what do you do? Oh, you carry on walking across the grass. It's only Jones in 4C. He has no authority here, certainly not over you. But if you did turn around and it was the headmaster, I mean, maybe you would carry on because people carry on when God speaks. You know, they carry on in their sin. But there's that conviction. There's an authority here. More than likely, you will repent of what you were doing going across the grass. You'll turn around and uh, you'll face... The headmaster, authority. There's a weight behind the words because there's an authority of the office <clears throat> of headmaster. Power of the Holy Spirit makes all the difference. We used to live, when our children were younger, we had uh, uh, six children, four of our own, and we adopted two. It's like raising a herd of buffalo, but we lived on a busy uh, road in, in Cardiff at the time. And uh, it was 30 miles an hour, the limit, not 20, 30. Remember the days? Whizzing along at 30 miles an hour. But of course, if you set the limit at 30, people do 35, creeping up towards 40. 
And this is what they were doing down this particular road. Well, I had young children, I was particularly sensitive, so I made signs to drivers. And they gave me signs back, because who was I? Remember the next week, a traffic policeman came with a speed gun. Do you know what happened? The traffic was very calm. No one was going faster than 30 miles an hour. That's authority. And the people were astonished. They were knocked out. They were bowled over. They were blown away by the power uh, that came in the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm reminded, I think, I, yeah, I did give the illustration that Spurgeon gave of uh, Thomas Boston's dream. But now, in Wales in 1859, there was a, a preacher, what's his name? David Morgan. Hmm. Been a faithful preacher for many years to his congregation. You know the story. Uh, one evening he went to bed like a lamb and he woke up the next day like a lion and the congregation noticed the difference. He was greatly used for about two years in Wales during the revival. And then one night he went to bed as a lion and he woke up as a lamb. God is sovereign. We can ask for this anointing, this uh, power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but God is sovereign. Uh, and meanwhile, as David Morgan did, we get on with our ministering and our works. And we're seeking, though, that unction and that authority and that power. Well, that was this morning. Now we're going to move on to the miracle that happens in the synagogue in Capernaum. <clears throat> you can say that there suddenly came a, a recognition as to who Jesus Christ really was. And it didn't come from his disciples. Some of them have been saying, could, could this be the Messiah? And uh, is it Philip got uh, Nathaniel? We've, we've, we found the one we think is the Messiah. He, he's from Nazareth. Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Oh, c come and see. Come and see. And um, certainly this recognition didn't come from the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, they're going to make their conclusions, most of them, that he's uh, an imposter and he's a blasphemer. Recognizing who Jesus Christ is is absolutely key. Who is Jesus? So have we got this settled in our minds? Is it, is it constantly settled? Or is it something historical that was settled once? Because unless it's fresh, we're going to drift. And we're going to be in religion or morality again. What we want is relationship. To continue in the freedom that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, seeing who he is. I remember I alluded to my conversion uh, this morning in Brisbane, Australia, 1976. I remember uh, being taken to church meetings by my cousins, new zealous believers that they were, <clears throat> and I would uh, have my arguments as a scientist. I was doing chemistry in Cardiff University. I thought I knew everything at the age of uh, 19. And uh, I'd say, well, but what about evolution? And what about Big Bang? And what about all the suffering that there is in the world? And um, a wise youth leader said to me, do you know, he said, the Bible, it's really all about Jesus. You need to settle who he is. And I'll tell you this, all those other questions that you've got will be, will be answered for you. And do you know, they were. They were. J just settling who is Jesus? And it happens here in the synagogue in Capernaum. And the first to give a right answer, in Luke's gospel certainly, to the question, who is, who is Jesus Christ during his public ministry, was, uh, was a demon. Well, what are these demons? Um, they're fallen angels. It seems there were three high-ranking angels in heaven. Michael, Gabriel, Lucifer, son of the dawn was his name. We read about his fall um, in uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 
28, Jesus himself says, I, I saw Satan fall like lightning. There was a, a fall. But there is a picture in Revelation chapter 12 of his fall. But it wasn't only Lucifer that fell and became the devil. Satan, the accuser, the opposer, the one who seeks to destroy. But a third, it seems, of the angels of heaven fell with him, those who didn't keep their first place. And uh, in their fall, there's no redemption. And they are constantly there to oppose God and his church. There's a time set when their doom is finalized. They know about the lake of fire. It hasn't come yet, and still it hasn't come yet. And there was a time when it seems they had free reign over the nations. Israel was being particularly kept, the apple of God's eye, his chosen people, but their task wasn't to keep it to themselves, but to be a light to the Gentiles. But here in uh, Revelation 12, let me start at verse 7. Now, war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent who is called the devil or Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth. And his angels were thrown down with him. And skip on to verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So, here in Capernaum, on this particular Sunday morning, and I reckon the, the synagogue would have been pretty full, people went to uh, synagogue and the religious police were there watching, uh, checking on who was there and who wasn't uh, there. But there's one man who is there. Let's think about the man. And he is, um, verse 33, a man who, was, who had the spirit of an unclean demon. Possessed. Physical body. My soul. Fallen angels. Very powerful. Generally, you don't see them. Spiritual beings. And there are times when you can see them. We can entertain angels unawares. Uh, three angels came to visit uh, Abraham as uh, God is deciding, what will I do? Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know the conversations that took place. No, they can materialize. Generally, we don't see them. And here is a demon who was strongly associated with this man. Maybe he's left the door open to this spiritual oppression or possession. But uh, he is there in the synagogue. Then, 2,000 years ago, demon possession was more common than we find today. I don't know if you're aware that you've met anybody who's been possessed by a demon. I, I'm not aware I've met anybody. I have had an encounter that, uh, well, no need to, to talk about it, but in, in prayer, something happening in a certain place, and uh, yes. These things are, are real. But since the victory of Jesus Christ on Calvary, there has been a radical change. What was once common is now rare. Mark chapter 3 and verse 27, Jesus speaks about binding the strong man and then plundering his goods. And on Calvary, the strong man, Satan, was bound. And uh, today in uh, Swansea and Cardiff, across the uh, Bible Belt of South Wales and throughout Wales, his goods are being plundered. Not as much, perhaps, as we would like. We need to continue to pray. But there are parts of the world where there's a radical plundering going on right now. The, days of, the day of Pentecost, around 3,000 were converted. Anybody been saved here today? Yeah. 
You know, I ask the same question of Heath. It's, but it's not the same story of the whole world over. You know, there are more being converted today than there were on the day of Pentecost. That's a, that's a certainty. Because there are parts of the world where revival is, is taking place. This is the power of the cross. Satan has been bound and his goods are being plundered. 1 John 3 and verse 8, the reason the Son of Man was revealed is to that he might destroy the works of the devil. Another little passage from Revelation, before we move on with the miracle itself, Revelation chapter 20, just in three short verses. What a wonderful uh, surveying of the work of Christ. Revelation 20 and verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not, now notice this, deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended after that, he must be released for a little while. Again, when was Satan bound with his chain? Calvary. Calvary. It was finished upon the cross. This the power of the cross. Christ dying for our sins, rising again for our justification. The power of Satan is now very, very limited. He's on a chain now a, a dog on a chain, don't get too close, a lion on a chain. Remember Pilgrim's Progress and Pilgrim fearing to walk her down the path. There's a lion either side. Keep to the middle, keep to the middle. Don't wander into Satan's territory. Don't be ignorant about his wiles. I, I love that phrase from uh, Paul when he's writing to the Corinthian church about the wiles of Satan. He says, uh, for we are not unaware of uh, the wiles of Satan. We're not unaware of the devil's schemes. That's the phrase he uses. I fear that we are. I fear that we fall hook, line and sinker into his ways far too often. But now he's being chained. And notice what uh, John is told in, in Revelation here. For a thousand years, and I believe various interpretations on that. Am I a premillennialist? A millennialist? Am I a postmillennialist? I'm not going to tell you, but uh, the gospel age, it's the golden age now. We, we can proclaim the gospel. Certainly the freedom you have here in Morriston and we enjoy uh, in, in Cardiff is, is quite remarkable compared to other parts of the world. And Satan has been bound. He is on a chain throughout the gospel age. Towards the end, it seems he'll be released for his little season and the man of lawlessness and the Antichrist when gospel preaching will be very, very difficult the whole world over. But now, while it's light, let's continue to preach the gospel. God kept his people. The world was in darkness. Here and there, one or two came to faith. Ruth, the Moabitess, uh, Naaman, the, the Syrian, but by and large, the nations in darkness, the light there in Israel. But through what happened on Calvary, a great burst. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Morriston, the gospel. God so loved the world. You and me, he gave. This is good news, not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles. Not just for the Jews, for the Greeks, and I'm half Greek, so this is good news. Good news. You said this morning, it's a great name, Andy Christofides. Well, you try spelling it as a five-year-old. It's uh, I'd much rather be called Smith or Jones or... Yeah, Griffiths even, or uh, yeah, Reese, very easy with uh, but Christophides, yeah. But uh, anyway, what was I saying? Yes, gospel for the world. Uh, he's been chained. But this man here, 
possessed by this demon. What a pitiful situation. And the demon cries out now. There's the man, now it's the demon who speaks, verse 33. He had the spirit of an unclean demon and he cried out with a loud voice. Cried out and uh, loud, um, the Greek word mega, with a big voice. He didn't whisper this. Nobody knew who he was, but the demon uh, knew. And uh, there's this little expression here, ha! It's a difficult one to interpret from, from the Greek. Um, it could be, aha! Or, ha! Ah! Or, yeah, ha! It, it, it is here, but there's something of, a, of a, a, a note of wonder and fear from the demon. Astonishment. Ha! What have you to do with us? Not the lake of fire time yet. Why, why are you here? I know my end is, uh, my, my doom is, is writ, but it's not yet. Surely it's not yet. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? It's not, it's not the time. <laughs> and I know who you are. And here it is, the Holy One of God. What an astonishing statement. Full of faith as to who Jesus Christ is. Others are in great doubt and they're wondering. Others are saying, well, he's a blasphemer. The demon knows exactly who he is. I know who you are. And the Greek word isn't just the knowledge, the, the knowledge um, gnosis, which means intellectual knowledge and uh, understanding, but it's genosco. I, I perceive who you are. It's possible to perceive who Jesus is and yet not be saved. James tells us the demons even believe, but they, they tremble. And this demon is, is trembling here. Ha! Ha! What have you, have you come to destroy? It's not, surely it's not the time, but I know you have the authority. I know who you are. I've seen you before. Mm -hmm. I perceive exactly who you are. Jesus, now his response, but Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent. Again, it's a strange Greek word here, phimos. Wrap up, put it bluntly. Be muzzled. I don't know how you and I would respond. We'd have to say in the name of Jesus. I say to you, Jesus, straight word. Not in the name of Jehovah, but by his, this is the astonishing thing. They've known demon possessed men before, and women, and children, and animals. Can't deal with them. He is a word. Not backed up by in the name of, but in his own name, with his own authority, rebuking him, saying, be silent and come out of him. Or it's really very blunt, go, wrap up, go, be muzzled, go. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. What, what else could he, could the demon do? Demons are powerful. You know, angels, we learn of them destroying a city. Uh, great power. Yet here's Jesus Christ, who isn't only powerful, of course, he's all powerful. He's the one who spoke, and the whole universe came into being, and scientists find this quite mind boggling. boggling. We can explore the universe and tell you what it is we can theorize about where it's come from but we can't tell you what was before the beginning can't tell you how nothing became everything <laughs> the more we see i mean when david says three thousand years ago when i consider the heavens the sun and the moon and the stars which you have established he said i'm so amazed who am i that you're mindful of me well david if you only knew the half why are we so slow? We should be utterly. Why? Just 
gasping. And scientists say, well, you know, it is there and it must have made itself. How is that logically possible? But here we have it, it's Jesus who spoke. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, here's the speaking word, let there be light, there was light. And this is Jesus, how powerful. Well, <laughs> creates a universe and the you know, 100,000 million stars in our galaxy of the Milky Way. Six million light years away is our nearest galactic neighbor, Andromeda, with a trillion stars in it. And then in the known universe, around 200,000 million other galaxies. Well, who am I? And who is this demon? Well, he, I know who. You, have you come? Surely it's not the time. Quiet. Get out. There'll be a day when we meet the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't want to hear those words. You know, I meet people who say you've met them. Oh, well, when I meet God, I'm going to tell him a thing or two. You won't say anything. You'd be like the man who didn't have the right wedding clothes on. Friend, what are you doing here without the right wedding clothes? And he was speechless. Take him, bind him, throw him out. Go. And we, we will go. His word is it's all powerful. He speaks and it happens. You wouldn't walk. You would just go. It would just happen. What authority. What authority. The demon has no answer. He must obey. Jesus, the name high over all, in hell or earth or sky, angels and men before it fall, and devils fear and fly. Yes, devils fear and fly. Let's look at the response of the congregation coming to a conclusion now this evening. Verse 36, And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. They were all amazed. Verse 32, they were astonished at his teaching. <coughs> astonished, and we thought this morning as to what the word astonished means, bowled over. They were amazed. Now this is a Greek word, thambos, uh, which means, yes, it can mean amazed. Uh, it can mean uh, to be dumbfounded. You know, what they saw, if we saw such things, dumbfounded, or another way the lexicon puts it is they were stupefied. Stupefied. Uh, just rigid. Speechless. Dumbfounded. But rendered it immovable. I like amazed, though. <laughs> amazed. I think, did I choose... I stand amazed in the presence. Yes, I did, I did. Remember what I chose. That's a lovely hymn. How do we stand? I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. I wonder how he could love me. A sinner, condemned, unclean. How marvellous. How wonderful. And my song, yes, shall ever be. Now, I've been going on with this song now for 48 years. Years. Anybody been a Christian more than 48 years here? Oh, we got one or two. Yes. Yeah. Isn't it what isn't it marvelous? It just gets better. Yeah. Seeing. I'm just amazed I'm still here in the paths and the circumstances. The valleys, the mountains, the difficulties, the rivers, the fires. But he never leaves, never forsakes. People have let me down left, right, and centre. How about you? Jesus? No. He remains faithful. So I've been singing for 48 years, but when we've been there 10,000 years, bright, shiny as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Let's make it a million. What's a million? It's nothing. What's a billion? It's nothing. 
Eternity is a long, long time. Where are you going to spend that? Are you saved here tonight? There's the gospel. And here we've got a picture of the gospel with this, this man. He's under the dominion of Satan. Sa Satan is the original sinner. He, he fell and he beguiles Adam and Eve and they fall and we're all, we all inherit this sin from Adam and Eve, our forefather and foremother. We're born with a disposition to, to sin. Uh, I'm the sinner, you're the sinner. Why do we do things wrong? Well, my friends, it's because we are wrong. There's a teaching, particularly amongst educationists, that children are born uh, neutral. <laughs> and it's their environment. Well, environment has an influence, but we're born sinners. The first word that children learn is, is no. If it's not the word, it's, it's, the, it's the shake of their head and <laughs> take that muck away. Or, and you try getting three children to play with one toy. It's, it's just not going to happen. We had some teenagers around this afternoon. We got one Xbox. They had two controllers, but who's going to have the special controller that controls the actual Xbox itself? Oh, it was Bedlam upstairs, and Dad had to go up and sort them out. Well, nobody's playing on it then. And it's rife throughout humanity. The great sins, the little sins. Why do they happen? Because I'm, I've got this problem, and it all stems back to what happened in the Garden of Eden. You can only explain the world through Genesis chapter 3. Why, why? What's happening in Ukraine and Russia? Why doesn't it end? Why does it go on? Why such horror? And what about Gaza and Israel? And they're just the things we hear about. There are sorrows untold the world over that we don't hear about because it's not in our interest, so we don't care. But it's still human misery, and it's sin. But the chief end of sin is that we, we don't know God and we're cut off from him and we'd spend eternity away from him. Now the lake of fire is for the devil and his angels, but we will go there unless there's no way out for the devil and his angels. But there is for you and me. And it's Jesus who came to destroy the works of the devil. He did it by taking away our sin. He lived the perfect life I can't live. He did it for me, he did it for you. Then he dies the death that we deserve. In effect, he takes the lake of fire for countless millions of people. And all I need to do, it's more than the demon, I, I know who you are. Maybe you got that far. But the demon never repented. Repentance is a gift from God as much as faith is. The demon knew who he was, I, I've seen you before. But there's no repentance there. Along with faith comes its twin, Repentance. And sorrow for what I am and what I've done. And I do what I do because I am what I am. Repentance towards God and faith in Jesus Christ. And the sin to my account was paid for on Calvary and the clean life he has lived is given to me. And I'm still a sinner, but I'm a saved sinner. The Holy Spirit dwelling in me should change me from glory into glory day by day. But instead of being a steady upwards, it's up and down. I don't know where you and I are. Uh, this evening, but glory to God, once saved, always saved. He's going to make sure that we're there because he's come to destroy the works of the devil. And you trust in Christ and he's got you and Satan will never snatch you back again. Have you been amazed by the Lord Jesus Christ? The people were this particular one. I don't know how many actually came uh, to saving faith. Maybe they just remained uh, amazed at what they saw. But that's not the half of it. The full gospel. Are we amazed by the Lord Jesus Christ? Maybe for the first time tonight. Trust in him. Don't go home uh, without him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of what you are. Trust in the Saviour. And if we are the Lord's, and most of us are, I can, I can see that. Let's rejoice in what we have and uh, give him the glory. Let's